This is the land of the free. Stories of life and liberty in a time of war. So we are today in the studio of Ukrainska Pravda, one of the oldest online media in Ukraine. And today with me in the studio is Joe Linsley. And we start a new project. Uh, please uh, remind me, what is the name of our new project? <laughs> well, we changed the name a couple of times, but now we're calling it Land of the Free. And you know, every American uh, baseball game or football game on a beautiful summer day, we sing the national anthem. And we sing these words, the land of the free and the home of the brave. And that's what I see every single day here in Ukraine. And uh, Alina, we met at a, a conference in Lviv just a couple of weeks ago. We've, uh, we've got a lot done since then. And uh, it was a conference of some of the most interesting volunteers and journalists uh, coming together to figure out how can we be smarter in our strategy for victory. And those uh, over those hours in Lviv, Alina, you and I were talking about Uh, you know, there's so many stories we encounter here every single day. As I've traveled the country to Zaporizhia, Donbass, everywhere, everywhere I go, I meet incredible Ukrainians and foreigners here who speak English very well, and they have stories that will make you cry, that will make you inspired, and I can't just keep these in, to myself. You know, I have my radio show every day, but that's just my voice relaying what I hear. And so together with Ukrainska Pravda, which is such an amazing free Ukrainian publication uh, started. We, 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 I want to hear the history of Pravda uh, from you. Uh, but we said, why don't we start this podcast, Land of the Free, to show Americans what, to make them feel like they're here, to hear these, these gripping stories of uh, people standing for freedom in many different ways uh, every single day. And I think Americans, we love the self-help genre. We love to, you know, people listen to Joe Rogan and you take an ice bath in the morning. The best ice bath uh, is to listen to the stories of Ukrainians and see what they go through every day and how they can still thrive, how they can still smile, joke, laugh, sing uh, while they're fighting for victory every single day. So land of the yeah. free. Yeah, the previous iteration uh, of the name of our podcast was Ukrainian Freedom Voices. And that's what you will have here. Like we will invite very inspirational guests Uh, who will share their stories and today we will speak about the freedom of speech about the media in Ukraine and actually at the conference we have met we have discussed that it was uh, one year and a half of a big war of the full-scale invasion and still we have some issues with foreign medias uh, who call the war like a conflict uh, who do not know how to transliterate Ukrainian names. And that's why we need to show uh, that uh, we are here, we together, and we need to be an example for our colleagues. And this, you know, one reason why we thought was, we changed the name away from Ukrainian Freedom Voices is because these stories are universal. I and mean, everything I see here, it's, it's people standing for their family, uh, with, you know, fighting in the trenches or fighting in so many different ways. Uh, for family, for freedom, for, for every value that Americans and good people around the world love. Uh, it's the land of the free, and it applies all over the world. And, uh, and Ukraine just seems to, is right now the place where these battles are happening in a most visceral, clear sense. Uh, uh, Lena, if I could ask you, what, how, because, I mean, I want to hear about the story of Pravda, but why, uh, you as a Ukrainian, why did you become a journalist in Ukraine? Well, uh, that's <laughs> that's an interesting question. I didn't think about it because, like, I was born and... Uh, on uh, Independence Day. On Independence Day, <laughs> which is important. Yeah, and coincidence, I think not. And I think that uh, when I was at school, I understand that writing is something I can do and something I want to do. So I decided that my life will be connected with this. And when I get older, I uh, understand that um, there are a lot of um, stuff which is going on and people should know about it and I can tell them. So I decided that uh, to become a journalist is a better way to show people what's really going on. And for now, it's very important if uh, the authorities forbid something like to go to the front line, Uh, to show some uh, new uh, tanks or some vehicles or whatever. It's still, we have the freedom of speech. And uh, from, I'm 
mostly in working from Kyiv and from here I can say whatever I want to say and to spread it to whoever I want to spread it. And the story of uh, the Ukrainska Pravda itself started as the story of uh, the media uh, which was um, created just because we need to have some response uh, to the infringement of freedom of speech. And in 2000, uh, Georgi Honhadze and Olena Pritula has created this media uh, because uh, like, we feel that uh, something is going wrong. And still, like it was 23 years already, we are trying to do our best to keep people informing and to show them what's really going on even even uh, under the martial law we make investigations about the corruption in the ministry of defense which was like several days ago and i think that it's really important to do this in this uh, context we live in when you make investigations about that corruption uh which i've read throughout the full-scale invasion uh do you ever get government people coming to you and saying you can't do this or I don't remember that it was like this, mm. but of course they go public and say that, oh, you're a journalist, you're mistaken, uh, that things are not like this, you need to check, uh, fact check your information more times uh, or whatever. But uh, of course we understand that the facts we have and the information we have is true. And only if we understand that it's really true, we can post it on, uh, on our website. So it's really important to us uh, to keep uh, the criteria uh, of independence media to check the information and to be a reliable source for foreign medias in, in this time. And have you seen any of your uh, investigations uh, since February 24th, 2022? Have you, have you seen an imp- have these investigations made an impact? Ha- have you seen you know, corrupt politicians sort of getting their comeuppance as a result of the light that the media shed? Yes. Yes, we see everything like uh, we see that people were fired from their positions, from their posts, like they lost uh, their power. Uh, However, sometime um, our investigation works not uh, as we wanted them to work. For example, uh, one of the last cases when we showed that MPs are uh, partying on the different restaurants which are opened uh, after the curfew. Wow. And uh, it was filmed by our journalist, Mikhail Tkac. And after that, the mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, uh, said that all the restaurants, cafes and um, whatever should be closed after 10 o'clock. However, people who live here, they need to go home after that time. They can't like buy some food or whatever. But uh, MPs who were going to the restaurants after the curfew still are going to the restaurants after the curfew. So it didn't impact as we wanted it. It actually hurt the people who yeah. need these services and those who break the rules still find ways to. Yeah, that's true. Right. That's true. That's why we need to continue our work and to show that, um, uh, okay, guys, you have power, but we ne- you need to use it better. You have power, but you need to use it better. And I w- I'd like to hear more of the specific stories that you've been looking into. But I think for Americans, because, you know, there's such a, a history of, you know, in, in the 90s in Ukraine, I can't imagine. I mean, everything I see about Kiev now and all of Ukraine, such a lovely society, a clean, safe, you know, uh, strong community. I heard the 90s was extremely dark and difficult as you were prying yourselves away from the grip of, of Soviet mentality. And so Ukrainska Pravda, the name Pravda means truth, but that was also the name of the Soviet newspapers, right? Yeah, that's correct. And it was propaganda. And so the name of Ukrainska Pravda was, it seems that it was clearly made in response to like almost a... a Yeah, it was a response to that propaganda newspapers. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we add uh, the adjective Ukrainska, it means that it's our truth. Like uh, after... We are not Soviet Union anymore. Mm. We are Ukraine, and this is our truth. And it's different country with its own language, its own media, its own whatever. 
So yeah, I didn't remember actually how hard it was during the 19s because I was a child. Uh, but still, yes, uh, it was a really hard period of um, how we realized that now we are an independent country and uh, how we show it to the world. For example, as we have um, discussed with you it's earlier that Ukraine is the only country who has changed its presidents for several times. Uh, for example, Russia, or Belarus or Kazakhstan can say that they have this opportunity to change their authorities when they want to change them. This is an extraordinary, and I had not thought of this until you mentioned it earlier, but the out of all of the major former Soviet bloc countries, only Ukraine changes its president. And Ukraine, since 1991, have you had any presidents reelected? Uh, yes, yeah. it was Kuchma. In the 90s. In the 90s, mm-hmm. yes. Uh, it was not the best uh, president still. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he was... Uh, actually, he was one who was against the freedom of speech and uh, uh, the protests um, for the freedom of speech uh, then uh, uh, lead to the protest against uh, those presidents, Leonid Kuchma. And then so from in the, in the entire 2000s, though, every president has served for five years and then Ukrainians kick that person out and vote for another. Yeah. Uh, and, and so and this is very this is totally unique in the ex-Soviet. I'm not sure that we are the only yeah. only country who has this, but uh, from the, our neighbors, yeah. like uh, just look at Lukashenko or yeah. Putin. Uh, that's not an example of uh, democracy. Exactly, and the, the the exceptions are the Baltic countries, the yeah, small, yeah. And, and and of course Georgia. Uh, but uh, so Kuchma was president late '90s, 2000, and you're fa- the founder of Ukrainska Pravda. Was born in Tbilisi, Georgia. Yes. I don't want to mispronounce his name. Uh, his name is Hrori Hankaze. Hrori Hankaze. Yes. A g- version of Gregory. Gregory. Yes. Hrori Hankaze. And he started, and I, I'm always, I was always captivated by the logo that he chose for Ukrainska Pravda. It's Don Quixote on a horse. Yes. Do, you, do you know that story? What, what was he thinking? Yeah, I think that uh, I- I- there are different uh, versions uh, why he has chosen this special logo. But uh, as I understand it, that when you're Don Quixote, you're very small. You're a small human being and you think you can't fight something bigger than you. But uh, the history shows that even a small people can fight big companies, big authorities, like to... And it's uh, in Ukrainian blood, you know, like uh, when you understand that you're um, not satisfied with something, like, for example, as it was uh, at the beginning of the Euromaidan in 2013, people were not satisfied with the decisions which our uh, authorities make. That time, Mikola Azarov, who was our prime minister, I think he decided that we do not need to euro integrate Ukraine. We do not need to go to the European Union. We need to continue our work with Russia, Belarus, and all these post-Soviet Union countries. And people in Ukraine uh, were already far from there, far from those points of Soviet Union. Uh, they understand that it's not the way they want to continue their life. And that's why the first Euromaidan started. And this, uh, could you say, well, it's very important to note that I think it was only five months after Ukrainska Pravda was founded that uh, her, uh, your founder, Gregory... Gregory Honhadze was killed, yeah. Uh, Ukrainska Pravda was founded in April, April mm-hmm. 2000, and he was killed in September already. And he was found like in a forest. Someone had assassinated yes. him. Yes, and it was very long case uh, because um, I think that uh, police didn't want to uh, solve it. And still, uh, this case is not solved. And then you had another of your famous journalists who was assassinated as well, it seems. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we had uh, another journalist who is actually a Belarusian journalist. He came to Ukraine from Belarus. His name is Pavlo Sheremet. And he was killed in uh, July 2016. Uh, it was um, a car, uh, not accident, but someone mined the car. Mm-hmm. And so it was the car of our also um, founder, the second founder, uh, Olena Pretula, who was with 
uh, Grigory Honhadze at the beginning of the story of Ukrainska Pravda. And they were a couple, so when he uh, started driving this car, it just blew up. And it's another unsolved case in the story of Ukrainska Pravda. So it's very, really dangerous to be a journalist in Ukraine, you know, especially if you work in Ukrainska Pravda. <laughs> <laughs> you say it laughing and smiling, but you, I mean, you have to laugh about these things, I guess, because you, uh, I mean, have you, how how many years have you been working with, with Ukrainska Pravda? I'm working here seven years. Seven years. Uh, so you were there right right after this happened. Yeah, yeah and, right after And that. what uh, have you, have you seen that type of, I mean, have you, have you been nervous at all for, for safety of your team? Actually, no, yeah. because like I was very young and uh, very ambitious. And when you start to work on the biggest online media in the country, you didn't think about consequences. Mm -hmm. And when uh, the things I should, I start to understand what's going on. And I knew that there were some cases and I understood that, yeah, actually like everyone here can be killed and we made some jokes that uh, special services listen to us <laughs> all the time and uh, some some stuff like this and it's also like about jokes but you know that uh, in every joke there is a little bit of truth so yeah it's it's hard to uh, to be scared of this now when we are scared uh, about missiles, drones, and whatever can Russia launch and, at us. So <laughs> you, you can handle a lot more. And I yeah. think one thing I've seen, and maybe, you know, you, as you tell these, the history of Ukrainska Pravda, you know, you had journalists from Georgia, from Belarus, they came here because here they could be free. Yeah, you still face threats from bad actors, but it's because of the people around you. It's because of what Ukrainians did in Maidan that together Ukrainians are not afraid. And that's why you're able to face missiles and rockets and drone attacks, uh, you know, even cheerfully face this. Uh, there is this sense of uh, Ukrainians are not afraid. Uh, and and uh, you put truth and honor and dignity first. Uh, the uh, Ukrainska Pravda pr played a role in the very beginning of the Maidan revolution, right? Yeah, that's true. One of our journalists who worked on Ukrainska Pravda at that time, Mustafa Nayam, in November 2013, he made a post on um, Facebook and he wrote that, uh, guys, we need to stand for uh, what we want and please take tea, please take some warm clothes because it's no middle of November, you know, it's cold in Ukraine and go there, we will be standing there and show that uh, we are against all this stuff that our um, authorities proposed to us. And that's how Euromaidan started. And at that time, Office of Ukrainska Prado was very close to the Maidan, so people just come there to get some tea, to grab some food, to, to sit, and it was like 24 per 7 working, uh, how it was it was uh, then, and uh, then we understood how it was uh, when the full-scale invasion started, and it was the same here. Do you see a connection, or how would you define the connection between Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine and Maidan? I think a lot of people, you know, in America, we don't know even recent history on this. Uh, what what was the Maidan revolution? Uh, it was the second Mandan, actually, uh, because the first was in 2004 and the second Maidan started in 2013 and people were against uh, Russia, actually, and they want to join European Union, they want to be progressive uh, and all uh, the stuff they have imagined uh, they will have after joining the European Union. We're still at the point where we are <laughs> not there, but uh, at that moment, uh, uh, I think that, yes, at that moment, traveling to European Union become visa-free for Ukrainians. And it also meant a lot because people could go abroad to see how it looks like there and to understand what they need to change in their country. So they look, so it should look like there. And uh, when we had those second Maidan, 
I think that um, the critical moment was when students go to the independence square and protesting and showing that they want to continue the way uh, to the good, um, not to the bad side. And uh, when Yanukovych, it was our president at that moment, uh, decided that um, he should punish all these people and he asked police to beat them. And it was the very beginning of something bigger because when uh, all those fathers and mothers understood that uh, someone beat their children, they also came to Maidan and it's become much more bigger than before. They awakened, they awakened the nation. And you know, when I hear those stories of the secret police, the Berkut, as they were called, it's so hard for me to imagine that that existed here because now we're in the full scale war. And as I travel and I go through checkpoints and I meet many police officers and, and soldiers, and there's such a kindness. Everyone is sort of treating each other well. The, everyone respects each other. If anything, I think the police are more afraid of the people than the other, definitely than the other way yeah, around. Yeah, but do you know why this happened? Because we have reforms. We have police reform, which changed a lot, actually. And uh, it was called militia, like it's called in Russia beforehand. Mm-hmm. And after all the reforms, it's become police. So it's policia. So it sounds even... Uh, like something you can believe to. It's there for the polity, for the yes. people, not not as some military trying to control. Yes. It's very different than like when we were watching the protests in Belarus in 2020. It's so different uh, feeling when you understand that you can, uh, you can feel safe with those people because they are here to protect you, not to beat you or to make something bad with you. Of course, like, uh, there is a lot of stuff uh, which should be done, like justice, uh, uh, judicial reform. But we were on, actually, we were on a good way uh, before the full-scale invasion started, because now the only thing that we can do is um, to fight against the evil which is not inside the country, but is outside the country. You can't have, of course, focus on reforms in the same way. But even then, as you point out, um, I mean, you have investigated corruption here because that corruption can get in the way of victory. Could you give, you gave the example of the MPs, you know, partying late and breaking the curfew rule. Um, Is there any other corruption here that you see that gets in the way of, of victory? Uh, well, actually, yesterday we had an investigation about um, the Ministry of Defense have bought um, jackets for the armed forces of Ukraine, and they were very overpriced. And it was the last investigation which shows that, uh, okay, guys, we see what you are doing, and we are in the middle of the war. You shouldn't do this. You are Ministry of Defense. You should defend. You should do your best to protect your country and your people. Well, so you published the story. Yes, yes, it was published uh, on the 25th of August. So, yeah. And I've seen, I mean, we had the big story uh, maybe a month ago or a few few weeks ago where President Zelensky uh, dismissed the regional recruitment uh, the, the office, uh, well, I forget what they were called, Vis- Vis- uh, Veskomat? Viskomat, Viskomat, yes. And these were, it was a Soviet-era agency yes. that uh, was recruiting, uh, would recruit conscripts. And uh, President Zelensky, a few months ago, had said, you know, he, he, he wanted to change it and reform it. He wanted front guys that had frontline experience to start to run these offices uh, because they were th- the guys that were leading the recruitment centers were too disconnected from the real fight. And, and so he dismissed uh, the, these reg- the, 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 the regional directors uh, of this unit. And I asked a friend in Ukraine, I said, oh, uh, what, what did you think about President Zelensky doing this? And my friend said, uh, well, actually, it was because the media and the people first, like President Zelensky and the democracy, he did what the people wanted. Yes, it's just a reaction. Yes. Yeah. And that's what we are doing here. Like, step by step, we are trying to get rid of all the Soviet Union rudiments. Yeah. Wow. I like this idea. The Soviet Union rudiments. 
uh, like the like the little you find in little corners of life, like little leftovers of uh, yes. Uh, that's that's <laughs> what we see. What's continuing to exist in our neighbor countries, mm. and they want us to be the same, and that's not what we want. We are different. We have different country, different language, different history, different everything. Mm. And a history of being free, wild Cossacks. Yeah, I'm from Zaporizhia actually, oh. and it's the uh, cradle of the Parisian Cossacks, and that's why, like, when I was on every history lesson, they uh, repeated us that we were born uh, from the like um, um, children from those who were very free, and we should be very free on our own, and it was really, really important. Uh, to um, learn like this, that when you understand that you can do anything, like you are free, you have the freedom of choice, the freedom of speech, the freedom which is in your veins. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's all been, been through, through the centuries there uh, and the Cossacks and everyone in the middle here had to fight off people from the East and the West. And as you mentioned Zaporizhia, you know, Zaporizhia city, you're, you're from Zaporizhia yes, city, right? Yes. And uh, that is, uh, you know, very close. Well, Russians already, you know, pretended that they claimed that territory. Uh, the, the front line is not so far from there uh, to the south. Uh, There's currently very intense fighting. And you, uh, what was the situation uh, the first hours? I, wa I want to hear about your situation as a journalist the first few hours and the first days of the full scale invasion. But before that, personally, because you're from there, because you have family there, what was it like for you the hours right before the full-scale invasion and as everything unfolded? Uh, well, before the full-scale invasion, we were waiting for it, actually, uh, because the first information was about that it should start at the 16th of February, and we were waiting then. And when it not happened, we decided that it's all. Then we were waiting for it on the 23rd of February because it's the den of the Soviet Union army and um, Russia loves symbolism and we thought that they will attack Ukraine on those days, uh, then. And uh, yeah, I was just uh, watching uh, Putin's uh, speech, famous, when he tried to teach everyone his history. <laughs> And then I go to sleep and I overslept the beginning of war because I didn't wake up. I have very good sleeping skills. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I wake up at eight o'clock in the morning, I think, because my mom called me and told me, Alina, it's war started. And I told you, mom, it's not war. It's just like martial law. It means that it can be war, but it's not still. And she asked me, did I see some news? And uh, while I was talking to her, I checked what's going on and I opened uh, Ukrainska Pravda. I don't remember how it was actually, but it was like the war started and it was red. It was caps lock and it was like. You understand that your life is changed at this very moment. Yeah. And I asked my mom what's going on in Zaporizhia. She asked that uh, they have heard some explosions and uh, um, the situation, like, we were very confused. We didn't know that, we, we understand, th we know that it could happen, but we didn't believe that it could happen. And that's why, especially, like, people who, like my mom, who lived in Soviet Union, they didn't expect that uh, the country, uh, like where they have so much relatives and friends and can attack them. And everything changed. Like, for example, my mom starts speak Ukrainian. <laughs> From that day? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> and because uh, she was Russian speaking, because mm -hmm. we were from the eastern, like southeastern part of Ukraine, where a lot of Russian speaking people. And at that very beginning, she starts speak Ukrainian to show that she doesn't want to have something in common with Russians. My dad uh, go to the armed forces like several days after the start of the full-scale invasion 
And I come to the office because we had a safe protocol, which told us that uh, if you have no, like your own car or some transport and you can't go in safe place, you just need to go to the office. And uh, then we decide what should we do. And I was there like in nine o'clock in the morning. And uh, it was uh, the time when we decided to launch English version to spread the information as much as possible and to show the truth from the Ukrainian point of view. And we were trying to fight Russian propaganda, which was very loud. And we understand that in this case, Ukrainian voices should be louder. What you so you had a choice, and you and the team had a choice that morning to the possible you you could escape. You had an ability to leave, and you yes, every uh, yeah, everybody yeah. has that choice. Like mm. you should like be safe. You should save your life. And we decided that uh, we need to spread the truth. Of course, like in some time we left from Kyiv to the uh, western mm. uh, part of Ukraine because it was safer there and we had like different uh, three different points uh, so um, it was very important uh, not to be together uh, so if in case if some of our offices in exile uh, in internal exile um, will be found and Russians will found us yeah. uh, then uh, other office will continue to do their job and spread information till the end. Because there were there were points where it was a very real possibility that Russian troops yes. could be on the streets here. Yeah, we were scared. Yeah. We like at that moment you can't imagine what can happen actually, and uh, all these news about that Kiev will fall in three days. You know, now we are laughing at it because like it sounds like a joke, <laughs> but at that very moment. We didn't know what to expect. What has been your scariest moment in On these this past war? 18 months so far? Wow. I think that uh, when I go to Zaporizhia and uh, I was just grabbing coffee with my friend and uh, then we heard a uh, missile very close to us. It wasn't a raid alarm alert because like uh, Zaporizhia is very close to the front line and they can shell it from S-30. Uh, which is like it's now uh, there is no possibility to turn a air rate alert mm. uh, earlier than they sh uh, then they shell the city and after the first explosions the air rate alert started and we decided that oh, it's okay like uh, they have already uh, uh, sent us all these missiles, what can be wrong? And then they continue to shell the Parisia and it was like explosions were on the factory. It was like less than one kilometer from us. Wow. And we didn't know where the nearest shelter. So we just needed to sit at the bench in the park and waiting. Did you keep drinking your coffee? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sipping coffee, waiting when uh, the attack, Russian attack, uh, will uh, fin will be finished. <laughs> does stuff like that? Does it get stuck in your dreams or? In my dreams, I see only my work. <laughs> uh -huh. It's like uh, you are dreaming and you understand that misleading headline and you need to change it and you need to make some uh, corrections and then you wake up and you continue to do that <laughs> same stuff. <laughs> That's the nightmare of editors. Uh, yeah. You can catch a typo or something as you're falling asleep. Uh, it's torture. Uh, what was has been your most difficult decision or challenge as a journalist during these past 18 months? I didn't think I had some because like everyone was so ordinary mm -hmm. because like you understand the circumstances you live in and it's not hard to make decisions. You understand that it's your job to make decisions. What is, uh, is there any piece of like Russian disinformation that bothers you the most that you wish people could really understand is not true? Oh. <laughs> There's a long list. <laughs> well, actually, at the beginning of the full-scale invasion, I, I tried to read Russian news because I, 
I wanted to understand what's going on there in their heads. Like, and uh, I was um, too weak for that, you know. I checked several news about biolaboratories and all this stuff. And it was so insane that my brain just um, told me, please do not do this. <laughs> Everything that Russia is doing is like very bad things. When you see that uh, foreign media still call the war conflict, or um, uh, try to keep the standards and uh, uh, give uh, the opportunity to speak to Russians. And it's also like, it's always a propaganda. It's not uh, uh, some sane stuff that they can tell us. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot of media which just spread those propaganda. And I think that it's not okay they just should stop. It's not both sides. Yeah. It's the side of uh, victim and the side of aggressor. You shouldn't give the word to aggressor. Yeah, and they do a lot of this without thinking. I mean, so often I see and from very respectable media, who, and I know the reporters here, they're very courageous, they care about Ukraine, but in the headlines and the stories, it'll say the war in Ukraine, not Russia's war on Ukraine. And they say, well, we can't repeat that every time, but they repeat the war in Ukraine every time. And how hard is it just to add in, okay, whose war is it? Because when you just say that, it sounds like, oh, this is some kind of weird accident or uh, it's like a tornado or a hurricane. No, it's a, it's humans in Russia have decided to do this. Yeah, they can call them also they. Who they? Nobody yeah, knows. Say who it is. Yeah. They launched missiles mm -hmm. to Ukraine, to Ukrainian cities. Who they? Just name uh, Russians as they are. They yeah. are Russians. Yeah, you'll see missiles were launched. You yeah, know. missiles were yeah. launched. No, no <laughs> passive constructions. Yeah, it's an active process. <laughs> yeah, and we know who it is. Like, And you saw this in the week leading up to the NATO summit in Vilnius. All the headlines were about uh, the cluster munitions, uh, which the United States had just agreed to give American cluster munitions to Ukraine. And all the headlines were sort of, oh, Ukraine is using... And the picture was... You know, Ukraine is using this very dangerous, you know, possibly, uh, you know, um, war crime type of weapon. And none of the story or most of the stories did not mention that the American munitions are completely different from the Russians. That American munitions are actually approved by the Oslo Treaty. Uh, they, they Their dud rate is less than 1%. So they don't and nobody has mentioned that Russia has used yeah. such kind of munitions since day one of the full scale invasion. Yeah. And, it, and it, it, like especially in Kharkiv, in cities, and some stories mentioned it in the last sentence. But most people, they only see the headline. And so when Ukraine went into the NATO summit, it was with this huge like, aura of negativity. And it's, just, it's, it's, it's not, and it comes from um, people who support Ukraine. Like, you know, most media support, you know, said this is awful. But because they're not being very conscientious these ideas sort of sneak into their stories. Yeah, because it's uh, stories without a context. And the context is that uh, Russian cluster munition has failure rate up to 60%. Mm. And American cluster munition has failure rate um, 2%, I think, up to 2%. Up to two, less than 2 yeah. yeah. So it makes that's sense. That's uh, a yeah. difference, you right. know. And that's why we need journalism to explain these things to us. Uh, so, well, uh, Alina... Thank you. I'm, I'm very excited about this collaboration and all the people we're, with whom we're going to speak. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, our guests will be very interesting. So, because we know a lot of people who help Ukraine uh, since uh, day one, since the full scale invasion, uh, and since the 2014, actually, like, so when the um, hybrid war in Ukraine started. So, yeah, we will try to show you such people and try to persuade you that uh, who is the side of uh, good ones and <laughs> who is uh, not very good. Yeah, and if you like, I mean, as American, I know we, we love superhero movies, the Marvel movies. Listen to these stories. It's like watching, it's a real life ver you know, version of a superhero movie every single day here. Uh, just so much inspiration. So... Uh, the people at the uh, center of human excellence uh, right now in the year 2023 uh, here in Ukraine. So 
Uh, I'm Joe Lindsley, our team, UkrainianFreedomNews.com, WGN Radio every single day, and now collaborating with the great team of Ukrainska Pravda, uh, Lina Polyakova. And we see you soon. Duže dziakuju. Duže dziakuju. Thanks.